Anybody wants to volunteer to mow the lawn, we still have, I believe we have one in our shed. You can talk to any of the trustees. Uh, we'll be more than happy to take any volunteers. The Whitman Food Pantry, uh, now more than ever, donations are needed at the Whitman Food Pantry. Items currently most needed are uh, regular mayonnaise, flour, rice aroni, small bags of snack foods such as pretzels, popcorn, chips, and goldfish crackers. Pudding, jello, and all types, all types of salad dressings. Cash or checks made to the Whitman Food Pantry are also uh, most welcome as well. Thank you for the wonderful response you always show, and thank you to John Barr, who volunteers as our representative of the Whitman Food Pantry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we are still uh, reviewing our social distancing guidelines uh, believe that a decision will be made by June 1st, um, and we will be addressing that. I just had a quick announcement in regards to Sunday, May 30th after church. The ladies of the church are invited to my house in the backyard. It's kind of just a Ladies get together, it's going to be a very simple lunch. We get a chance to meet Crystal. Scott's going to be babysitting his children, so Crystal has the afternoon off. So we're going to get a chance to kind of really get to know Crystal and just for us ladies to chatter, which is always wonderful. So, what if uh, 12 o'clock at, at my house? Uh, any questions, certainly can call the office or call me. My number's plastered everywhere on Facebook and website. So, thank you. Hope to see you all there. Good morning, Dr. Captain Thompson Hunter. Today, the Soul Sisters of Women's Fellowship will be meeting today at 1230. If anyone is interested in going, you can let me know. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And thank you, ladies of the church, for the wonderful moment of hospitality for Crystal uh, next Sunday. Um, <coughs> prayers, jokes at my expense, or support can be offered to me watching our four children via email or telephone this week. Um, at this time, let's open with a word of prayer. Dearest Lord, we love you so much. We are surrounded by your majesty, the beauty of your creation, the sounds of your presence in the created world around us. Lord, help us every day that we live to kneel before you and exalt you rightfully as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you for the freedom that we have to gather together as again as a people of faith. Let our worship be sweet to your ears and let us celebrate the reality of you as our Lord and King. We love you. We ask this in your sacred and holy name. Amen. And now our call to worship. A love that never ceases. A A hope that cannot be quenched. A pursuit of reconciliation, no matter what the cost. These are the things that are our God. Let us call and worship him now. Our opening hymn is in the red hymnal, hymn 478, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Let's stand and sing together, 478 in the red hymnal.
And now our prayer of illumination. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditation of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. Reading from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, beginning with chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, if someone in your group does something wrong, you who are spiritual should go to that person and gently help make him right again. But be careful, because you might be tempted to sin too. By helping each other with your troubles, you truly obey the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is important when he really is not, he is only fooling himself. Each person should judge their own actions and not compare himself with others. Then he can be proud for what he himself has done. Each person must be responsible for himself. Anyone who is learning the teaching of God should share all good things he has with his teacher. Do not be fooled. You cannot cheat God. People harvest only what they plant. If they plan to satisfy their sinful selves, their sinful selves will bring them ruin. But if they plan to please the Spirit, they will receive eternal life from the Spirit. We must not be tired of doing good. We will receive our harvest of eternal life at the right time if we do not give up. When we have the opportunity to help someone, we should do it. But we should give special attention to those who are in the family of believers. Would you please stand for the singing of Gloria Pasha? <laughs> Sunday. For those of you who want a detailed explanation, Acts 2 in your Bible can give you that. But Pentecost was the day that the Holy Spirit fell. Jesus was crucified on a Friday. On the third day, he arose. That was Resurrection Sunday. And 50 days from Resurrection Sunday is today, Pentecost Sunday, which is considered the birth of the church. Happy birthday, Christian church. Today, I would like to ask you, as you sing this song, to think about the Holy Spirit. Verse number one says, I am yours, O Lord. We want to ask God today to give us a brand new, special anointing of the Holy Spirit. Should he do that, and he will if we ask, we are then a VIP, where the V stands for vision. We ask God to give us a vision of who he wants us to be. I stands for identity. We know who we are. We are children of God when we have the Holy Spirit. And P 
stands for power. On Pentecost Day, the disciples and others were gathered in Rome, and Jesus, when he appeared to them the last time, said, when I go back to heaven, I shall leave behind the Holy Spirit, and when I do, you shall receive power. So we want the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work that God has given us. When the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples and those people, something happened that day. There were tongues of fire that appeared on their heads. So today as we sing this song, verse 3, where it says, Consecrate me now, I will stop so that we can sing that a cappella and truly pray to God for an anointing of the Holy Spirit. stand as we sing the doxology.
love you so much. We are so grateful for your provision upon our congregation of faith each week. Thank you for all who have given. Help us to utilize the blessing and provision you bring to us to be the lighthouse to a dark and dying world. We love you so much and we're thankful. We're so thankful. We ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let us read together the prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in our word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly resent it. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Our assurance of forgiveness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We believe, although we fall short, we must persevere to the end. Hold tight to his holy word. Thank you so much. In my years of teaching, and in my smaller case study of being a parent, I hear this a lot, and I've heard this a lot. I'm too tired. Please clean your room. I'm too tired. Let's finish the layup drill. I'm too tired. Don't forget to study for the midterm. I'm too tired. Now, I love children, and children are an inspiration and an illumination to us on a weekly basis. And guess what? For every humorous antidote that I share about young people and little people, I can add the Library of Congress to all of us as adults. Being a child of Christ requires that extra mile. Being a child of Christ requires a little bit more towards the yes side of your tank instead of the no, which is it. Now, we can't be all things to all people, but my challenge for our children and for all of us in the week ahead is let's find more moments this week when we are brutally tired, when we just want to lay our head down. And when the unexpected happens, Let's say yes. And let's find moments to surprise someone with generosity, a listening ear, and love, even when we are most fatigued. Our sermonic hymn is hymn number 473 in the Black Hymnal. Blessed Assurance, what a wonderful hymn. 473 in the Black Hymnal. Let's stand and sing together. Thank mm -hmm.
Thank you so much. You may be seated. The author and pastor David Brooks shared a wonderful quote. The people who radiate a permanent joy have given themselves over to lives of deep and loving commitment. Giving has become their nature. Now, as we've spent time talking about this journey of love, we've talked about hosts and pilgrims from faraway lands. We've talked about moments of hospitality here. I found a really interesting quote, though. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a paraphrase from a speech, from a commencement address in 2005, from the author, well, the, he passed away a number of years ago, the late writer, David Wallace. He said the following, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. He went on to say the only choice is what we get to worship. Basically, if we make a decision to live a spiritual life, that's the most logical path because everything else will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, where you tap real meaning from that, you will never feel that you have enough. If you worship your own body and your beauty and your allure, time and age will start showing and you will die a million deaths. If you worship power, you will feel weak and afraid, and you will need more power over others. Keep the fear at bay. If you worship your intellect, you always are on the edge of feeling unintelligent, a fraud, being found out. Now, I thought about that quote, and this week I had already planned to spend some time in First Kings with King Ahab. And I think there's a lot of connected, connectedness to that. Just to, re to remind us a little bit, King Ahab occupied the throne of power and privilege. He was not a Yahweh follower, and he worshipped false gods. As a ruler, Ahab was accustomed to getting his own way, whatever he wanted, and as his wants were unceasing, more and more people were damaged and hurt. Now, King Ahab acted as if, as if he was entitled to own everything in his realm, regardless of the cost to others. He found that he wanted to own a vineyard next to his palace, a vineyard that belonged to Naboth. Maybe he wanted it for his own garden. Maybe he had visited another king that had a similarly large garden and vineyard, and now he wanted the one that caught his eye. Ahab was not a barbarian king, although he had abandoned Yahweh. He basically said, Naboth, I want the vineyard. Now, you can imagine any of you as homeowners or business owners, if someone knocked on our door and said, let me have it, the common sense response is, you can't have it. Just as Naboth said. Ahab said, I'll trade you for it. Naboth said, no. Finally, Ahab said, I'll pay whatever the market price is. Naboth said, no. Now, King Ahab returned to his palace, climbed the stairs to his room, slammed the door, and beat his fist in the pillow and had a fit. His queen, brace yourself for her name to remind you, Jezebel, this isn't going well. Hearing all the sobbing, goes into the king's chapter and sees her husband in this pitiful state and asks, what's going on here? Naboth won't give me his field. Jezebel says, what kind of king are you anyway? Haven't you heard of an eminent domain? The field belongs to you. Go, take it. I can't, Ahab says. So Jezebel says, then I will take care of it for you. I'll show you what a real king looks like. Now, before I get to the scoundrels and where this goes, here's the reality. 
We are at war. I'm not making a political statement. I'm making a spiritual statement. We have won the battle, but the war rages on. Because on this planet, there are forces of darkness and evil that are ever present and always trying to consume every good step that we take forward with a pull backwards. What that also means is when we make strides of generosity, selflessness, and true love, as we've talked about the past few Sundays, there's going to be a pull. And there's going to be a pull from those that are self-centered and self-isolated and filled with false idolatry. Why? Because they don't want to be alone in their misery. You can stack the gold up to the ceiling, and guess what? When Christ returns and all of this ceases, the gold is going to matter for nothing. So, to set the tone there for Ahab's support and wickedness with Jezebel, these times and th these things have not changed in our world. Jezebel arranges for two scoundrels to get rid of David by publicly and falsely accusing him. Innocent, albeit, which tragically led to him being stoned to death. As soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he set out to claim his prize. That wonderful vineyard is mine. But whom should he meet coming in the other direction but the prophet Elijah, his old nemesis, who had previously confronted him about worshiping false gods. This time Ahab, like a fugitive who expects to be caught, said, Have you found me, O my enemy? Elijah responds, I have found you. You cannot treat people as hurdles in your path of grief. You have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Ahab's selfishness brought disaster upon himself and his own lineage. And I go back to the verse in Galatians. We reap what we sow. Nobody in this room, and I've said this before, and I hope that I serve with you many, many years and say this a thousand more times. Y'all are terrific people. Y'all are good souls. But nobody in this room is without sin. We all have our moments. But you see, when Ahab and those close to him said, you can have what you want with no consequences. Times have changed. This is all yours. You won't get caught. No one will stop you. You won't be held accountable. Well, I know this. I know that in 2021, God still speaks as clearly and as real as he did in the time of the prophet Elijah. So, we must be careful when we say, I've had enough, I'm too tired, I want more for myself. And let's bring those thoughts and that story they have back to our own day. Because you may think, you may be thinking, Pastor Scott, I'm really not planning to take my neighbor's property. I'm really not planning to overthrow the restaurant down the street. How does this connect to me? Here's where I'm going. You think about our Western culture and how that has permeated out to the world. For the past, I'll be generous and say 50 years, but I think it's probably more concise than that. What have we worshipped as a society and a world? Self. Self. What we want, and more specifically, what I want. The culture of me. Molding the self, investing the self, expressing the self, all of those things are fine. In the confines of understanding that self is not ours, we belong to God as a people of Christ. 
capitalism, icon glorification, all have normalized selfishness. And you may say, okay, icon glorification, you would be amazed at the millions and millions and millions of hits every week that someone gets on a YouTube channel or another social media platform just with them discussing what? What they ate for breakfast, how they brushed their hair, bad analogy for me, <laughs> what they like. The worship of self. And make no mistake about it, every time that there is a sense of idolatry that points back to us, that is not Scott Wasden painting the details. Those are the forces that are against the way of Christ. The narrow way. Love your neighbor. Give to others. Put Christ first. Think of relationship with God before all else. All of those things run so contrary to the concept of self. Because here's the thing. I enjoy having a few moments to myself. Take a walk, mow the grass, have some reflective meditation time. As I told you before, watch a ridiculous, meaningless ball game late at night. I can assure you I'm going to have a few minutes of self this afternoon watching Phil Mickelson's pursuit of the PGA Championship. But, but, when it's all about me, and it's all about self, preoccupation, distance from others, division, and social alienation become the vernacular and the language of our lives. Here's the good news, though. There is a hopeful path. We hear those words from the Apostle Paul, you will reap whatever you sow. There's also a positive light there. Paul, writing to this early Christian church in Galatia, he's just reminding them not to focus on selfishness, not to ignore the needs of others, which in turn were ignoring God, but to live to please the Spirit. To live to please the Holy Spirit and God in heaven. Think about that for a moment. Because it's not rocket science. As we shared last week, greet people with a smile, a hello, how are you? Hopefully in a matter of time, whatever the new normal is, a handshake, a fist bump, you know, an elbow smash, a headbutt, wherever this goes in the days ahead. By the way, please don't headbutt anybody. Now we do. Here's the thing though. Whatever makes people feel good about the Christ in you that you're expressing, here we go. Don't grow weary in doing good. Don't grow weary in going that extra mile for love and hospitality. That is going to be a harvest time and time again that is sweet fruit. And as I shared in previous weeks, you may not be the one that gets to see someone come into the light of a happier, more balanced relationship and life with Jesus Christ. But we've still got to continue to plant the seeds. Because every time that we do that, we are solidifying and making a very public statement that we believe in Christ with all the things in this world, with technology advancing things in the past 20 years that are beyond imagination. We still sit here today in this beautiful sanctuary in a world filled with technological advancement. We still acknowledge that Christ alone is the only hope for our planet. That technology and innovation and robotics will not be enough. That love, generosity, tolerance, forgiveness 
will be the way that leads our planet to a greater sense of harmony. And not growing weary is also trusting that goodness is stronger than evil, that life is stronger than the roller coaster and the merry-go-rounds of idolatry and division and self-centeredness. And I understand that every time we cut on the news or hear a headline, we're bombarded with news of corruption, racism, violence, poverty, international crisis. You fill in the blanks. But God calls us and God's salvation for our lives is not just an individual moment. It is a moment for us to be here in the arena for the good of all. For the good of all. And I know that it's a temptation. You know, all of us sometimes we get tired. And sometimes we have moments where we run into walls and people say no and we don't see the results that we expect. And that's tiring and it's frustrating. But we can't take the tactics of withdrawing or giving up or accepting the status quo. We've got to believe that what we're doing has a grander and greater purpose than emotional, <coughs> physical, or intellectual gain for us in real time. This is about heaven. This is about eternal life. And I believe that if we are not to grow weary in doing what is right, we have to shift our focus. We have to say every day, God, I look in the mirror and I want more of you to be reflected to the world and less of me. Less of me. Our focus must turn away from ourselves. What we can and cannot make happen towards God. And you may say, well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to be at the front line. Absolutely. But guess what? The moment I say, because I know this, or I've studied here, or I've served there, as my first words on the paragraph of my service, I'm missing it. God, Christ, His forgiveness, His love, his salvation for our lives must be the starting point. And you see, people want so desperately to have this sense of joy. And I believe that this type of servanthood that we strive for, of not growing weary, bears incredible fruit that is everlasting and sustainable and will not change. Psychologists call this moral elevation. Basically, people having hospitality and generosity given to them unexpectedly, and they feel years younger, and they feel an upward elevation emotionally and psychologically. Well, to me, that's lovely, but here's the thing. If we as a church, with all the great things that we're doing, can continue to sustain the way that we serve our fellow woman and man. People aren't just going to see the moments, they're going to see the sustained cruising altitude of a church that loves, of a church that tolerates, of a church that embraces, a church you can depend on. I think for many, 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 many years that has been who we are. But as I've shared throughout my tenure here, people are coming out of something historic. And I realize we've had tragedies in our country, but people are coming out of the longest periods of isolation and detachment that we've ever had. And we don't know how everyone's heart, emotions, and minds are. But we know this. Our church needs to be a lighthouse. Our church needs to be a storehouse. Our church needs to be an endless ocean of love that people know they can step their feet into and the water is going to be just right. 
and they're going to want to stay for a while. I know that in my own life, when I get tired and I don't feel my best, my ability to give out suddenly starts being restrained and pulled. We've got to fight through that. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't focus on self-care. Get plenty of rest. Eat your vegetables. Drink your orange juice. But we can't delegate or pass the buck endlessly on how we take care of other human beings. We've got to care enough to give a little bit more. I love this story as I'm moving to a place of conclusion as we move towards prayer time. Several years ago, a man named Micah Harrell had a heart attack. And in fact, Mr. Harrell flatlined several times on the day of his heart attack before recovery. In 2020, Micah returned to work. And just as the pandemic flared, his art design company, located in the American Gulf Coast, was closed like many other businesses because it was classified as non-essential. Now think about the details of that story for a moment. Man has a heart attack, small business owner, he's been on the sidelines, finally coming back to dive in and get things launched again. And the doors are closed beyond his control. Now, I know that my mind, as a business leader, as a dad, as a husband, I start thinking logistics and analytics and details instantly. But his first thought was reaching out to the local mayor and city council to see what he could do with his business. And he offered them an alternative. He stocked his shop with toilet paper, gloves, hand sanitizer, paper towels, emergency items, and non-perishable foods. Now you may be thinking, what a brilliant entrepreneur. He probably was very, very highly successful. Everything was free. Even his mother, who was a clothing designer, made free cloth magazines. Now, needless to say, the community in which they live continue to be overjoyed by the efforts of this family simply trying to live out God's charge to love a little bit more and offer a depth of hospitality that is beyond expectation and beyond what we normally would invest. I know this. I know that there are more distractions than you ever could imagine. Everybody is busy. Everybody has people they care about. Everybody has interests that are significant and important. But, but, God looks at us and says, pilgrims do not grow weary of working for the good of all whenever you have the opportunity. We will face the Ahabs and the Jezebels in our day-to-day -day life. Make no mistake about it. I would love to say this is going to be a path that is lined with roses and lollipops and cotton candy. It will not be. There will be conflicts. There will be moments and you just want to say no. But my challenge to all of us is, if we can find those moments of going the extra mile on our pilgrimage of love and hospitality, that may be the one solitary moment that the seed of salvation is planted for that person that comes our way with a divine appointment. As we move to a place of prayer, are there joys and prayer concerns that would like to be shared with the congregation before we pray? Yes. Thank you, brother.
I want to thank everybody for the wonderful prayers that were um, sent to my family um, of Kelly Armour and her infant son, James. James came home from the hospital a week ago Monday, and his mother came home this past Friday. Thank you, thank you very much for all your prayers. Thank you very much for sharing that. That's wonderful news. We will continue to be in prayer. Are there others? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'd like to ask people to pray for the family of my work friend, Felix, who lost his battle with COVID this past Thursday. Uh, he was a big influence on my life at work. He's always calm and collected and peaceful. Uh, and this is a, a crushing blow considering how close we are to the end, to the end of the tunnel. And he was just set to retire soon. Um, just prayers for his family that they can make it through this. Very sorry for that loss. Thank you for sharing that. Are there others? Yes, yes. Um, I just want to say it's a wooden family. I won't say their name because they don't know. Yeah. Um, but just a prayer, friends of ours, um, their daughter's been struggling with eating disorder and just recently um, got admitted into a special program to help with that. So it's been a, a long, long road for this family. So we just want to keep them in our Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, and we most assuredly will be in prayer there. Anyone else? Let us turn our hearts together in prayer. Dear Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for the freedom of being able to turn our concerns and our joys to you each week. We love you and we exalt you as the Lord of our lives and we are humbled beyond measure that you seek relationship with us. Lord, for the prayer requests that were mentioned, we pray for the family that has lost a dear loved one to COVID. We pray for all the details of their home and their lives moving through this time of grief. We pray that there would be moments of restoration for them in the months and years ahead. For the family that has a daughter that is down for the eating disorder, we ask that you be with all of the doctors and specialists and all of the treatment options, that there might be sustained success and change in that young woman's life. For all the prayer requests that are within our bulletin board, for the wonderful news that we heard of Kelly and James, for all the others, the new, the new births, those who are recovering from surgery and illness, we continue to pray your embrace, your peace with each family and with each situation. And let us now pray, as your son taught us so long ago, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 551 in the Black Hymn. On the first, third, and fourth stanzas, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. 551 in the black handle as we stand and sing together.
May the grace and peace of God be with each household represented here today. Let our steps be filled with love, impact, and hospitality in all that we meet in the week ahead. We love you, Lord. We pray this in the holy name of Christ. Amen. Amen.